I'm going to go ahead and do a second lecture on ecology. Uh, I don't know how long this is going to be. I'm going to try to knock it out in one in one meeting, and I'm going to work on some lab stuff so that we can have some semblance of a grade for lab. Um, as far as I know, I'm not allowed to get back on campus, um, and I have grades on the computer there. I don't have access to them. That's that's the reality of that. So, don't know what else. Don't know what else to tell you. I may wind up having access to them. I don't know. That's not been determined yet, and I can't get any answers on it. So, um, anyway, but I, I'll work on something um, that will cover a couple of the things that we would normally do in the second half of the lab. May just go ahead and do a general lab exam as well over, you know everything comprehensively and and put that up and I'll do that real soon like in the next day or two so let's get back into this um, stuff on ecology this is um, from chapter 7 in Tolaro and we've talked about ecology what that is it's the study of the interaction between living things um, between one another you know, living things and um, the biotic components of their environment, as well as the interaction between living things and the non-living components of their environment, the abiotic factors. So there are biotic factors and abiotic factors. Um, so for you, interacting with other living things like other humans or, you know, uh, organisms that we have to deal with like house flies and mosquitoes and you know your pets and the plants that you have in your yard and, and so forth those are all living things that would impinge on our lives and so they could be considered as you know biotic factors that we deal with but then there are things like temperature and you know oxygen in the air and co2 in the air and other non-living uh factors that that impinge on us that affect our quality of life and so um, we're biological entities and we're subject to the same sorts of constraints um, and exigencies that um, other living things on the planet have to deal with um, one of the things that living things have to obtain are nutrients and um, some of these things they must get from the surroundings, um, from the foods that they're eating and so forth. And those are essential nutrients. We've talked about that. Some of them are macronutrients that we need lots of. Some of them are micronutrients that we need very small amounts of. Um, so there's that, um, that aspect of uh, interacting with the environment that we have to take into account. Um, you know, and among those essential nutrients are those that contain carbon. So if you are an organism that acquires your carbon from organic molecules that you take in, um, uh, glucose as well as other carbohydrates and proteins and lipids and so on, if you have to uh, acquire your carbon from those sources, you're a heterotroph. You eat or you, you know, you ingest or absorb those substances to get your carbon. And then autotrophs are forms that can get their carbon from inorganic sources, principally CO2. They take that in and they have metabolic machinery to reduce that carbon, that is add hydrogen to it, and wind up producing carbohydrate. Glucose is the principal um, one of those in this case as well. So they do this number, they take CO2 and add to it hydrogens that come from water or maybe in some cases from other sources like H2S, hydrogen sulfide, um, in the presence of light. They can you know, obtain energy that way. They can convert the CO2 into glucose, C6, H12O6 and then produce oxygen or if they're not using water as their hydrogen source 
as their electron source, but instead are using this H2S, they'll produce sulfur. And so that's one way that autotrophs go. Um, they use light for the purpose of producing organic molecules from CO2 and electron containing sources like water. Um, there are still other ways that autotrophs can, can function. Some of them don't even have to use light. The lithoautotrophs are able to um, do a lot of this in the absence of light. Some bacteria are lithoautotrophic. They can just take CO2 and uh, pull electrons from other sources and reduce the CO2 to, to glucose. At any rate, always these forms are using inorganic starting materials to make their organic molecules. They literally make their own food. The heterotrophs, they have to go out and acquire that food, right? That's the difference. And then we've got um, determination of nutritional types on the basis of where they're getting their energy from. So you get your energy from organic compounds, your chemotroph, you get your energy to run your metabolism, you know, at least the baseline um, ensemble of reactions and metabolism, you get your energy from light, your phototroph. And we talked about how you can put those terms, chemo versus phototrophs and hetero versus autotrophs, you can put those together in different combinations and come up with these um, more specific nutritional types like photoautotrophs and chemoautotrophs and chemoheterotrophs and photoheterotrophs. All of the organisms on the planet um, basically fall into one of those four categories, and each one in turn, each organism you look at is going to be categorizable into one of those categories. All right. So we went through that. We got through there. Now this section in here I usually cover really quickly. This deals with transport across membranes. I'll do this fairly quickly. Um, any type of means by which materials come into a cell across the membrane or conversely leave it. If it requires no energy for that purpose, uh, then it's a form of passive transport. So in the case of passive transport, ATP is not required, right? There's no ATP that's expended in passive transport um, types of movements of materials across membranes. And so uh, the types of passive transport um, that exist include diffusion, which is the movement of materials other than water, down a concentration gradient um, into a cell, right? So uh, the, the, the concentration of the substance, whatever it is, is really high outside of the cell um, and it's low inside. So there's a gradient, there's a gradation, right, of concentration. Let's say this is a cell represent a, a bacterium. And let's say we've got this substance, these little dots are some substance. Could be some ion like calcium ions or sodium ions or whatever. And the cell needs those. If the membrane is set up to enable these substances to diffuse across it, um, if, they're, if the membrane is porous enough and is, you know, not resistant to the entry of these things, if these particles are small enough, they'll just come on in. They'll move down the concentration gradient and go from the region of high concentration out here to a region of low concentration in here. And um, no energy is expend, expended to make that happen, right? So that's a, that's a concentration gradient, going from high to low. And eventually the stuff will start to accumulate in here and once the concentration outside and inside are equal, the movement of the material in is going to be opposed by the movement of material out at the same rate. So an equilibrium will have been established. There's a sort of steady state. So that's diffusion. Some people call it passive diffusion, which is sort of 
redundant um, because those two terms basically imply the same thing, no expenditure of ATP. And then um, we have a special case and, and erase that, a special case of diffusion, which is osmosis. And this is the movement of water down a concentration gradient into a cell, right? And if that happens passively, this is osmosis. So uh, now what's going to dictate the direction in which water moves is the concentration of other substances, things that would be dissolved in the water or what we call solutes. Well, let's say we've got a little container here just to illustrate how this works. You've all seen things like this before in classes that you've taken. So here's a tank of water, an aquarium perhaps, and you set, you know, down the middle of that, let's say there's a barrier that you put in here, some sheet of some kind of membrane, like dialysis membrane. This is what that represents. And, you know, little tiny pores exist in that. And so what's in here in these two compartments um, are water-based solutions. So we've got side A and we've got side B. Let's say in side B, in addition to the water, we include some solute. Let's say this is starch, um, some kind of starch. And I, and, I, and I use that as an example because starch grains, starch molecules are really large. And so they're not likely to cross membranes really easily. So this is solute that's more or less trapped in this side. Now, because there's a lot of solute here, the solute's taking up some of the space that the water would have um, uh, taken up. And so side B has less water than side A, right? There's more water over here on side A than there is in side B. So where's water most concentrated? Well, it's on side A. It has high water. Concentration of water is high. And this has a low water concentration on this side, right? The water's gonna do what? Well, it's gonna go to side B. It's gonna start moving across here. And what will eventually happen, of course, the water level on this side's gonna raise up and it's probably gonna start spilling out eventually. Um, but yeah, so water, one thing that people often say to, to help them remember how this works is that water always follows the solute. But if you've got a situation where you've got, you know, water-based solutions and they're separated by a membrane and one side has a whole lot of solute and the other side doesn't, the side with a lot of solute is going to be the receiving side. It's going to take up the water and water's going to follow the solute. So let's use a cell as an example here. So here we've got a cell. The cell, some rod shaped bacterium, and let's say there's a lot of solute inside of here. This could be uh, any number of things protein molecules, these could be ribosomes, these could be ions of different kinds, who knows? But there's a lot of stuff in there, and this organism is out there in a watery surrounding environment where there's not as much solute. What's water going to do? It's going to tend to come in. The water is going to follow the solute and it's going to enter that cell. Um, and so it'll swell. Now, bacteria don't have really you know, sophisticated mechanisms to help get rid of excess water. So as they take it up, you know, eventually it's going to become excessive. They're going to need some means to be able to resist blowing up or going through lysis. And so as we talked about previously, chapter four, you know that bacteria and other prokaryotes, archaea, always have a cell wall out there. And so that cell wall is a tough layer that's going to prevent that cell from exploding in response to this uptake of extra water. Okay? So that's, that's diffusion of water, and we call that osmosis. Okay? Um, 
And the converse is something that could happen too. We need to be aware of that. Let's say we've got a cell. Now let's say, you know, there's the solute inside of the cell, but let's say the solute outside is a whole lot more concentrated. It's really loaded with solute out here, All right? A whole bunch of solute out there. So which way is the, the, the concentration gradient going to run for water in this case? Well, it's going to run from the inside of the cell where there's less solute to the outside where there's more solute. Water follows the solute, right? So the water in this case is going to go out of the cell. And it's going to start to shrink as a result of that. Um, you know, the cell wall is not of vital importance there. The cell wall doesn't have a role there. Um, it's not going to help prevent that shrinkage, but, but that, that can happen. So anyway, it, it, it's a, it's a two-way street with osmosis. Cells can either take up more water or lose more water, depending on which direction the concentration gradient runs in. And then we've got another, I guess you could call this a special case as well. This is also diffusion, but because it doesn't require ATP, but um, there's, a, there's a carrier, which is a type of protein that will be embedded in the outer surface of the cell that will help to move materials across. Right? But again, no ATP is expanded and there still is the requirement of a, of a concentration gradient. So if you've got a cell and you have in that membrane I was going to try to make my pen size bigger. Let's say there are these little proteins embedded in here. Proteins embedded in here. And um, let's say there's little channels through them. These might be places through which substances are, some of them are going to have to come through. So these would qualify as carriers. So substance X attaches to that carrier, and then the carrier then deposits X inside of the cell, and it would be, you know, functioning as a as, as a transport mechanism and facilitated diffusion. What makes it different from these other um, types of passive transport is that they always require these carriers, all right? But, um, you know, they will only work if you've got a lot of some substance outside. They'll help to move it in. They'll continue to do that until, you know, the inside becomes loaded up with whatever substance you're talking about. Once it reaches a, a point where the, the concentration outside and inside is equal, then the, the facilitated diffusion is going to stop. All right, until that stuff gets used up and then some more will be brought in. And so there's that. So no ATP, the requirement of a carrier, the requirement of a concentration gradient that would all indicate to us that facilitated diffusion is what we're doing. Now in active transport, there are tra active transport mechanisms, there will be ATP that's required. So ATP is required here and typically there's also going to be um, carrier proteins used, but these can function and move things against the concentration gradient. So we say that active transport is gradient independent. So let's say there's a substance that's already present in large amounts in a cell. All right, even if the gradient is running from low to high, you know, low outside, high inside, carriers in this membrane, and this is horrible, I know, carriers in this membrane will help to move X in against the concentration gradient. You already have a lot of X in here, but the small amount that's outside is still brought in, all right? You're, you're shoving more and more of that substance into the cell because it's something that's in high demand, all right? So 
That's active transport. I mean, like, you know, I always use the analogy of a classroom, and I tell students a classroom that we're sitting in is like a, like a cell. Let's say we're in the interior of a gigantic cell, and the walls around the room are like the, the membrane of the cell. And a door or any other opening through which things could come could be like the carrier in the cell's membrane. And let's say people, students, are the things required by the, um, the cell. And so as students walk by, they're going to come through that door. And to, to make this analogy or this metaphor, you know, fit active transport, imagine every time a student walks by the door, they have to come through the door and come into the room. So eventually you're going to have the room full to capacity. But it doesn't matter. The, every time a student comes by, you're going to continue to bring them in against this, you know, this surge of large numbers of students inside wanting to get out. Right? That's that's something that um, would be resisted by the cell, and the cell would continue to bring things in against that gradient. All right, and then we have. Um, group translocation. This is this is active transport, but with a twist. It's it's where as a substance comes in, it is you know modified in some way. And often um, what that involves is adding phosphorus, actually phosphate, to whatever is brought in. So the word I'm trying to write here with my finger is phosphorylation. So like let's say you got a cell. And you got glucose out here. This is glucose. GLU is glucose. You might have a carrier that helps to bring it in, and that's often, in fact, the case. Glucose is brought in with the help of the carrier. And as it comes in, it's, it's phosphorylated. A phosphate is added to it. So it becomes glucose phosphate as a result of being brought into the cell. I know that's very ugly very poor drawing, but I'm doing that with my fingers. So anyway, that's group translocation. So you add a little bit of something to the substance as it's brought in to sort of tag it. And you know that's that's often the hallmark feature of group translocation. And then ball transport would be energy using processes that go against the concentration gradient that bring in large numbers of things at one time. So endocytosis would be bringing things in um, in large amounts by invaginating the cell membrane. So you bring in a bubble of membrane packed with lots of some substance. Exocytosis is just the opposite of that, releasing things in bubbles of membrane that go out in large amounts. And then pinocytosis is where Cells take in fluids, water, for example. So this is like cell drinking, endocytosis. Endo and exocytosis is where you're actually bringing in particles of things. Pinocytosis is bringing in fluids. So this shows how passive transport works. This is not crossing a membrane. Or anything like that, but it shows what's happening at the molecular level. This is a cup of tea, and they placed a, a lump of sugar in there. And so, right at the beginning, that lump of sugar is a solid mass, but there are, you know, water molecules in in the tea. And as the water molecules move around, um, they bump into that um, sugar cube, and they dislodge the molecules of the sugar. And the sugar molecules then break away from the, the lump and they start moving their way out into the surroundings. You know, it's, so a few seconds later, the area around that sugar cube is going to start to become loaded with sugar. And then a little bit further on, a few minute, minutes later, it's going to get sugary out here. And then several minutes beyond that, it's going to get sugary out in here. And finally, at some point, that sugar cube is going to completely dissolve and the sugar is going to be equally distributed all the way around.
Well, the point is that these molecules in this suspension, in this solution, have kinetic energy. They are moving. And it's that movement that causes the, the, the distribution of those substances. They're going from a region of high concentration here in the sugar cube out into regions of lower concentration. Right? And no energy is expended to make this happen. No ATP is spent. Um, there's no carriers involved. It just happens passively. Um, this inherent kinetic activity of particles, you know, like molecules of water and sugar molecules, um, that movement that they have is sometimes called Brownian move, movement or Brownian motion. So this is this is what drives passive transport mechanisms is this Brownian movement. And this illustrates osmosis. But what they've done is they've created a bag out of some sort of porous membrane, some dialysis membrane, and they've attached it to a glass tube, and they've filled that bag with a sugary solution um, or solute-rich solution. It could be sugar, it could be salt, whatever. So this is a solution in here in this bag with some solute, and the solute molecules are big enough that they can't escape the bag. The water molecules are small, and they can cross that membrane. And so if you put the, um, um, this, if you could think of it as a fake cell into a solution, um, uh, as is shown here in this picture A, all right, um, what will happen is water molecules, which are high outside, the number of them is much higher outside than inside, water molecules are going to come in to that bag. And as they come in and become denser and, and, and more concentrated inside of the bag, what's going to happen in this case, instead of the bag swelling up and bursting, because there's a little glass tube at the top in, in picture B here, you can see the, the height of the column of water in that tube gets higher and higher and higher, right? So, if you had a bag that had even more solute in it, the height to which that solution in the in the tube would go would be even higher, right? So um, that would help us to measure the amount of basically you know pressure or force that that solute could generate. And we talk about actually osmotic pressure. The solutions that have a lot of of solute in them have high osmotic pressure. Solutions that don't have a lot of solute relative to others have lower osmotic pressure. By the way, um, the the water side of of the you know membrane here, the water on the outside, that solution is said to be hypotonic. Hypo means below, so it's deficient. The solute-rich solution inside of the bag is hypertonic. So I'm sure you've learned about tonicity before, but that's what that's about. And this shows actual cells and how they respond to these different solutions. So here's a here's a cell with a membrane and a wall around it. The wall is protective and it keeps the cell from exploding or you know collapsing in different solutions. In the case of a situation where the solution inside the cell and the solution outside the cell are equally concentrated, where you know we have isotonic surrounding conditions, the cell neither uh, shrinks or expands, but it stays the same volume. And that's what you want. That's the ideal situation. Is is where the the movement of materials in and out, movement of water in and out, is equally um, you know, is, is equal. You have an equilibrium. Now, if you have um, a solution inside of the cell that has very little solute, um, and um, excuse me, if you have a solution inside of the cell that has more solute than outside, um, they don't show it that well in this picture, but the outside here is supposed to be out in this region is supposed to be mostly water and low solute, the water's going to tend to go in. 
going down its concentration gradient, and that cell will swell. And you can see the, the membrane of that cell is pushed up right up against the cell wall, so it's really tight. Now, it's not going to blow up because the cell wall is rigid enough to prevent that. All right, so that's what you get in a hypotonic surrounding solution, one that's got more water, that's more dilute than uh, what you have inside of the cell. Now, if you put the cell into a salty or solute-rich solution, where outside it's really loaded with solute, and um, you know, follow that cell over over time, what's what's going to happen is the water's going to come out, going to follow the solute, and you see the cell shriveling here, pulling away from its cell wall. And that's called plasmolysis when that happens. So this is. These responses here, all three of those, in iso, hypo, and hypertonic solutions that surround the cell, that's what we would expect to see in bacteria. We would expect to see that in fungi and um, protestins in those cell walls. So I've got an attack dog that's a little winter dog that's, that's going nuts because somebody pulled up in the driveway. Disregard that. I'm going to keep going. So here we have what we would have in cells like those in your body or other organisms that don't have cell walls. Not bacteria, but some protestins like amoebas and others that don't have cell walls. This is how they respond. And you can see under isotonic conditions, those cells, you know, are fine. They neither swell or shrink. They maintain their volume. But in hypotonic solutions, this is in the hypotonic setting, right? A cell without a cell wall is going to take on water and it eventually will burst. And so this is, as they call it, osmolysis, or we can just call it, we can just take the L-Y-S-I-S -S off of there and just say this is lysis. That's what it is, cell rupturing. And then, in this instance here, um, we have, again, plasmolysis. We could call this plasmolysis, too. You can see a cell that's all shriveled. Um, some people refer to this as crenation as well. That's another term that is um, used for that. This is crenation. All right. If you called this plasmolysis, I wouldn't. If you called it crenation or plasmolysis, I wouldn't care. The same deal. They're both responses to hypertonic surrounding solute-rich, um, salty, often salty or sugary solutions outside of the cell that draw water out of it. So again, then this shows facilitated diffusion. So this is a cell membrane, and these are carriers. So the big blue glob is protein, and it's got a it's got a little place where this this substance, whatever it is, can attach. So it comes in there. This is going to come in here and bind and, and attach to that carrier for a little bit. They have a lock and key sort of fit. And then once that <clears throat> is accomplished, then the carrier changes shape and shoots that substance through and prepares for the acceptance of still another one of those particles and they're going to keep coming in these x's represent the little purple particles they're going to keep coming in until they're as concentrated inside as they are outside and then you're going to see this you know temporarily sort of shut down so it, it necessarily requires a concentration gradient and so is a form of diffusion but because we're using proteins as carriers it's facilitated diffusion so there's that and uh, by the way, if you're if you're trying to, to think about things that would come through cells in this fashion, be larger molecules, things things that don't just easily slip between these phospholipids and this bilayer. Larger things are going to require carriers if they're going to pass through by diffusion. And um, in our bodies, glucose is commonly moved by way of facilitated diffusion. Uh, if you're looking for an example of a substance that moved this way, that would be it. 
And then we have active transport, which often involves the use of a carrier, but again, here we're using ATP, so ATP is expended, and materials are pushed through against the concentration gradient in many cases. So this is, on this side, picture A here is just plain old, you know, honest to goodness, classic active transport. Here we've got our, our solute, whatever it is, being brought through a carrier, but ATP is always spent in the course of doing that. So um, that that material, as long as ATP is available, and as long as this, the, the substance is out here, it's going to just keep coming through, come, come through, even against the concentration gradient. Right, and then this is group um, translocation, where you can see these little guys that are brought through are, are pulled through with the help of a carrier and with ATP. ATP is spent in this as well, but you can see what you get on the opposite side is something different. You got the little um, purple capsule shaped thing here um, with this additional substance, some, some side group added to it that looks like a little pink box or a lavender colored box. So you've got the, 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 the melding or binding together of those two things. And that's something that has to happen apparently for this substance to come in. So we would call that group translocation. Like I said, often the thing that's added is a phosphorus containing side group in many cases. That's very frequently the case. Then endocytosis and, and uh, related um, uh, exocytosis. Uh, endocytosis is the bringing in of, of bubbles of membrane containing multiple items. So not just one particle at a time, but multiple items. Um, you can bring in water that way. So that would be, this is pinocytosis because these are particles that are actually being brought in that are solid. This is phagocytosis. And here we see oil droplets coming in. Now, do they come in by way of um, uh, the formation of a vesicle? Well, not, not always. In fact, what happens with these oil droplets is they literally just sort of melt into the phospholipid bilayer of the membrane because they are very similar chemically to one another. So they can just come on in. Here we've got a bubble of membrane that literally surrounds water in the case of pinocytosis of water. There's actually a vesicle there. In the case of the oil droplets, there's no vesicle. So that's not um, a, a form of active transport. That would be a passive diffusion of those things. All right, so review that with transport processes. Those are kind of important. And organisms are interacting with their surroundings and nutrients and other things, cofactors and so on are being brought in. Um, this is how it's done. So if a cell is in a concentrated glucose solution and the glucose moves, is moving into the cell through a carrier protein, it would be an example of, says it's concentrated glucose solution and it's moving into the cell through a carrier protein. Doesn't mention anything about ATP. Seems that there's a concentration gradient from high to low, high being outside, low on the inside. Carriers being used. This looks like facilitated diffusion. That's what I would accept as the answer. Oh, this is active transport. That's not right. So let me change that. Put an X through that. This is what I'm looking for. And the reason that this is not a good choice, not correct. I knew there was one of these like this in here that was wrong. Um, the reason this isn't required is there's no mention of ATP up there, so ATP is not required. I apologize for that. So 
But yeah, if I put this question on a test and I probably will have something similar to it, this is what I'm looking for, folks. It's facilitated diffusion, right? That. Okay, so now um, we get into another facet of ecology and that is the concept of the niche or niche. Um, and people pronounce it both ways and uh, you hear one person say it one way and then another person say it the other way and they're both right. So I usually say niche, um, ecological niche. Right? So each different kind of organism, uh, whether it's a redwood tree or a human being or a, a great white shark or an E. coli or whatever it is, each kind of organism has a particular sort of ecological niche um, that describes it, you know. And, and so the, the niche that an organism occupies um, is determined by how it responds to all of the myriad environmental factors that we'll have to deal with. Um, so some people describe it as the totality of all the adapt adaptations that organisms have to have in order to occupy a particular habitat. So like for example, a largemouth bass um, has to be able to um, absorb oxygen from water, right? So um, the ability to live in water would be a component of its niche. And, you know, the water has to have a certain amount of oxygen. The oxygen concentrations that it requires, that would be another aspect of its niche. The water has to have a certain pH. If it's too acidic or too alkaline, it's not going to be able to thrive. And so that's another aspect of its niche that would describe the conditions that the largemouth bass could live under. Um, there's going to have to be um, a certain temperature. If the water's too hot or too cold, it can't live. So the range of temperatures that it can, that it needs would be another aspect of its niche. So you could think of all of the different environmental factors a particular organism would have to deal with. pH, temperature, oxygen level, water level, you know, how much water. Is, is present in the surroundings. That's something that for some organisms is important. Um, and on and on and on. Any one of the different elements that occur in the surroundings, the organism is going to have to have, you know, is, is likely to have some sort of range of concentrations of those elements like sodium and calcium and phosphorus and um, sulfur and on and on and on. Um, you can see that um, this can get real complicated real fast. Now, usually when people study the niches of organisms, they focus on the things that just really stand out, the things that are really obviously important to the organism and leave it at that. But basically anything in the environment that an organism has to respond to could be considered a component of its niche. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a really, in, 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 uh, when we take it to extremes, it can be really a very complicated um, kind of uh, concept to, to think about. Um, a lot of the factors that we would want to measure to know the, the, their parameters, the parameters within which the organism can, can exist, a lot of those factors are important because of their effects on the enzymes that the organism has. So um, the enzymes of a desert uh, living organism, a place where it's really hot, the enzymes that that organism has um, would be able to function under higher temperature conditions that have a range of temperatures that they could withstand that would be different, say, than an organism that lives in the Arctic in a polar region where it's really cold, right? So the, that would necessarily mean that the niches of those two organisms are going to be different, at least with regard to temperature. Um, and, and the same would be true for other factors if you know those affect their enzymes as well. So the 
enzyme affecting and enzymes are the remember the chemicals they're proteins enzymes are proteins that are genetically determined so your genes basically code for these proteins um, that uh, control metabolism they are the catalysts that's another word we use for them. They're catalysts. They make metabolic reactions happen. So like if you take in glucose into your, um, into a cell, uh, that glucose is going to have to be broken down. It's oxidized to release energy. You know, there are enzymes that will facilitate that, will enable that to happen, all right? Um, and whether or not they actually do their job is going to be dependent on, you know, the the environmental conditions that are in place. So, so these things here, temperature can influence them, and oxygen. If it's not at the right level, you know, certain enzymes don't function properly. pH, you know, the acidity of the surrounding. If that's not maintained at a certain level, enzymes fail. And then, you know, osmotic pressure, that relates to um, how much water and other solutes are present in the surroundings. If that's not adjusted and maintained properly, enzymes can fail. And also barometric pressure, that's the amount of atmospheric pressure that bears down on the organism. So atmosphere, you know, is the gaseous part of our surroundings. You know, it, 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 um, if you want to know where the atmosphere exists, it's all the gas from the surface of the Earth on up into space, you know, for uh, several thousand meters, even miles. That relatively thin layer of gas around us is, is um, the atmosphere. And, you know, if you live at sea level, the amount of atmosphere over top of you is greater than it would be, say, if you lived high up on a mountain somewhere, less atmosphere over top of it. So you might think that that pressure is negligible, but you'd be wrong. That pressure variation affects how organisms function. And it's not limited to just atmosphere. If you live way down in the ocean, there's water in addition to atmosphere bearing down on you, and that pressure can be really uh, extreme and can affect how organisms function. So all of these factors, plus a bunch of others. These, these are this is just a um, a kind of all-star cast of, of factors that could bear on enzyme function and in turn organism function. Um, they're they're highlighted here because of time constraints, but there's other things could could be. So temperature um, as um, an environmental factor, uh, we could say a niche um, component or niche factor. Temperature is really important. It's one of the first things that students mention when I ask them, you know, what are some things in the environment that can affect how, um, you know, well an organism functions? Temperature always comes, comes, um, comes up at some point usually at the head of the list. Got playing playing um, in or out with these dogs are coming in and out constantly. So anyway, <laughs> for any one organism, name an organism, pick an organism. If you were to take that organism and subject it to different temperatures, ranging from really, really low up to really, really high, you're going to see in that range um, places where they function well and places where they don't function so well. So the absolute best temperature for a given organism where it where it is most comfortable and where its metabolism is operating at an optimal level would be the optimum temperature. That's what it likes the best, right? So if you've got a particular organism and it has an optimal temperature and the environment has a whole range of temperatures from cold to hot, you'll see that organism kind of um, uh, becoming most densely populated in 
places in the environment where the optimal temperature is found. And it's going to avoid the cold places and it's going to avoid the hot places, right? And so let's say the environment that the organism lives on is your body, right? Lives in or on your body. There are some places that are probably warmer than other places. And so um, you've got cool places and warm places. Um, particular bacteria are going to find the, the site on your body where the temperature is just right for them. So they, the surface of your skin is cooler than, say, in your core, in your gut, for example. Organisms that live on your skin surface find that to be the optimal environment from a temperature standpoint. They wouldn't do so well in the depths of your gut because it's hotter there. And so um, there, there's one instance of how this uh, information can explain what we see in, in nature sometimes. So the optimal temperature is that which the organism really prefers. Now, if you cool it off, eventually you, the temperature gets too low. If you go below that, the organism fails. So the minimum temperature is the organism, is the temperature that the organism can handle that allows it to just barely you know, survive and reproduce. And it's just enough to allow it to do that. You go too low, you go below that minimum temperature, they're gonna die. So the organisms on your body, if you were to place them in a refrigerator, say at uh, four degrees centigrade, which is just above freezing, they're probably gonna die. They're not gonna do well, or they'll go into some sort of suspended state of animation where they're just dormant. Um, but you know, there are organisms that thrive well in refrigeration level temperature. The things that live in milk that can cause it to spoil, apparently like cold temperatures, right? Now, would you find those in your body normally? Probably not. So organisms are adapted to different temperature regimes and they find the best temperature at which they function. And that's dictated by the enzymes. Their enzymes, you know, either fail to function or, or function really well, depending on the temperature. And then the maximum temperature. Now, th this one, if the, if the temperature is maximum and you go beyond that, organisms again will fail. And the reason that they fail is that at these very high temperatures, if you exceed them, proteins will denature, right? Which means proteins will um, basically change shape entirely and stop functioning. In fact, they're destroyed um, when you exceed the maximum temperature. So that's why maximum temperatures are are evident is because you know, there's a point beyond which enzymes actually literally denature. Minimum temperatures, um, real cold temperatures don't destroy proteins. But what they do, they don't destroy enzymes. So what, what they do instead is they just slow down chemical reactions. That's why minimum temperatures are effective. They slow down the kinetic activity of molecules. Maximum temperatures are are maximal and effective because they denature, they destroy proteins. So for any organism, you could study its reaction to temperature and graph those responses and you'll see that the, it produces curves that look like this. Now notice how these curves look bell-shaped, but they're not quite bell-shaped. The bell-shaped curve would be one on a graph where, you know, perfectly symmetrical. If you draw a line from, say, the height of that curve down to the x-axis, you'll see that you have the same amount in the tail on the right as you do on the left. They're symmetrical. They're mirror images of each other. But look here. When you take one of these curves, these are temperature um, profiles, essentially. I call them temperature profiles. That's what these graphs are. When you look at these temp temperature profiles, you find the peak, and if you draw a line straight down from the peak to the x-axis, you see that the amount of the curve to the right of our vertical line is a whole lot less 
the space under there is a whole lot less than we have on the left. This area here, the left is much more extensive than the area right. And that's the same in all of these. They're, they're not symmetrical. Um, you can see there's a peak, and, and, and that's where the rate of the growth is the highest, and so that's the optimal temperature. That would be the optimal temperature. And then you can see there's, if you go past the peak, the curves always come back down to the x-axis, come down to zero. Below that, you know, or above, uh, above that, rather, the, would be temperatures that are too high to support the organism. And if you go to the left of the line, you'll come back down to the x-axis. But notice that that's a very much more gradual descent on that side. Again, you, you, you come down to a temperature that um, is the limit. And you go below that, the organism isn't going to So organisms in this curve right here, we'll call it curve A, are extreme thermophiles. You can look at the optimal temperature. That's 125 degrees centigrade. Now what's amazing about that is this is higher than the temperature at which water boils. So um, to get water to get that hot, you're going to actually have to place it under pressure, increase the atmospheric pressure over it, and then heat it up and you can get it that hot. But under normal conditions, it won't do that. This would be <laughs> what we might see at very great depths in the ocean, where you have volcanic activity, cracks in Earth's crust. You got all this water bearing down on those places. The pressure's super high. Um, the water can get superheated there, and there are some organisms that live there. So they would be considered extreme thermophiles. They thrive under very hot conditions. They do well there, like that sort of condition. Um, above that, you can see very quickly, we go much past 125, to a temperature of say around 132 or 133, see the organisms die. What happened there? You're at the maximum temperature, that's where denaturation happens, okay? The point of denaturation. Denaturation of protein is what occurred at that point. And then you, below the line, below the optimal temperature, you can see the temp, the, you know, you go, come down to zero uh, when, when zero growth. And so at that point, for, for extreme thermophiles, the temperature is about 68 right in here. The organisms aren't killed there. There's no denaturation. It's just that temperature is too low for them to be able to metabolize optimally. So we've got these different classes. B, these are um, thermophiles. You can see their optimal temperature is 70 degrees centigrade. Uh, I don't know what that translates to in terms of Fahrenheit um, temperature units, but it's in the triple digits. It's, it's way in excess of 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's pretty hot. Those are organisms that you would find, say, you know, living at the surface of the Earth around geysers and um, other kinds of geologic sorts of phenomena, like at Yellowstone National Park, you have uh, hot springs and places like that where the water is very hot. But it's not going to exceed 100 degrees centigrade. This is the boiling point of water. That's where water boils. Um, at, under normal pressure conditions. Not quite that hot, but it's pretty hot. So those are thermophiles. They like heat. The root word file in all of these cases means love or like. Right? Mesophiles, right? So their temperature optimum is right at about 37 degrees centigrade, which if you've been paying attention all these years in your heat classes and so on, you know that that is human body temperature. So um, these are organisms that could potentially um, live on or in you and uh, 
exploit your body as an environment. So either the things that live on you commensally or mutualistically or parasitically, in any of those organisms are mesophiles. So that's the environment they prefer. So the gut flora that you have, those are mesophiles. Organisms that are living in the back of your throat, which there are bunches of them there, they're going to be mesophiles for the most part. And uh, then you've got organisms that have a temperature off them right around 25 degrees centigrade. So these aren't living on or in bodies, but they're uh, in the surroundings um, in our homes. So 25 centigrade, that's room temperature. That's about you know 70 Fahrenheit or so, maybe not quite 70, but it's around room temperature. So if you've got organisms living on your keyboard of your computer or um, on your tabletops or you know on your cell phone, um, those are probably going to be um, forms that prefer temperatures right around room temperature. And these ones are referred to as psychrotrophs. And I apologize, I don't know the etymology of this. Now, trophy means refers to growth, but psychro, I'm, I'm not sure where that derives from, but that is the root that refers to these organisms. So psychro, notice it's not psycho, but it is psychro. All right. So <laughs> organisms living in your garbage can, for example, they're, they're allowed to be psychrotrophs. We get down here. Organisms whose optimal temperature lies right around 4 degrees centigrade, which is about the, the temperature that your temperature, that your refrigerator ought to be set at. Now, it's not quite freezing, but it's pretty cold. And, and the reason for that is it's going to um, prevent any of these organisms up in here from being able to persist and possibly cause spoilage of the food in, in there. So, but you have some few organisms that are psychrophiles that like those cold temperatures that can live there. That's why, you know, perishable items that you put in your refrigerator do have an expiration date. They eventually will spoil um, because those organisms begin to um, increase in number and cause fermentation and other things to happen in, in that food, which would uh, ruin it in terms of its taste and texture, maybe even make it toxic if there's some some of these organisms producing toxic substances that they secrete into that food. You ate it, you could get um, poisoned. So there are those kinds of things. All right, so temperature, really significant, really important um, factor determining um, where a particular organism can live. So this is a major niche component. Gas requirements like oxygen, um, super important. We're of course oxygen um, using organisms. We're obligately required to, to get oxygen. Now, it turns out that other organisms have different oxygen requirements. Some of them can use um, uh, much less than, they need much less than we do. They need it, but much less. Some of them can't live in the presence of oxygen. And that's because oxygen, oxygen is pretty highly oxidative. It is pretty highly chemically reactive. And in the presence of organic molecules, it does damage. It reacts with them and breaks them down. And so um, organisms that require oxygen also require, along with it, enzymes that help to prevent the oxygen from being too destructive, right? So we take it in, but um, there's a price to be paid for that. We have to produce substances that detoxify the oxygen. Uh, some of you may know that if you were to, say, have a patient who's on oxygen, requires oxygen supplementation, that the oxygen, if it's in pure form, if it's pure oxygen, it can actually do some damage to their tissues. Um, oxygen causes rust to happen, so metals will undergo oxidation and, and rust. Plastics and wood and other things like that in the presence of lots of, lots of oxygen will ultimately start to break down. You know, we talk about dry rot, 
of, um, of say, uh, wood and, uh, you know, the resultant destruction of the wood as a result of that. You have an old plastic chair that you put out on your patio and you leave it out there in the elements year after year after year. One day when you go to sit in the chair, it just collapses under you <laughs> because oxygen has broken it down. So, yeah, there's a bunch of different forms of oxygen as well. Um, oxygen molecule, the stuff that we're breathing in, is actually two oxygen atoms joined by two covalent bonds, so a double covalent bond. And we take this in, and this is used um, in um, the electron transport chain in the, in, at the end of that process that's required to make a lot of ATP. Uh, that's where oxygen comes into play. Um, that's why we need it. Just that one little step right at the end of that. Um, now, as oxygen is taken in to cells, sometimes it's altered in different ways. And uh, this stuff here, o O2 is what it's called. It, it's pretty destructive on its own, but other more destructive things can be formed from it. And so they're, they're listed here, what's called singlet oxygen. Superoxide is an oxygen molecule with an extra electron added to it. Peroxides, hydrogen peroxide is H2O2, so it's like water, but with another oxygen thrown in there. And then we have hydroxyl groups, which are ions actually. So oxygen with one hydrogen bound to it takes on a negative charge. And all of these are very destructive. These are what we call free radicals. You probably heard of that, free radicals. And, you know, people um, try to um, take in lots of antioxidant types of um, foods. Um, antioxidants are substances that bind up these free radicals and take them out of circulation. Now, if you don't get adequate antioxidants in your diet, apparently, this is one hypothesis that's out there. Apparently, these free radicals can become super abundant and cause damage to your DNA and can, you know, predispose you to cancer and other things like that and cause inflammation and so on. So um, eating your, your vegetables, uh, greens, tends to, um, you know, elevate antioxidant levels and may help to diminish free radicals. Anyway, organisms have to deal with these forms of oxygen. This is, this is not um, a minor uh, thing for a lot of organisms. It can be very, very significant in determining how well they function. So um, if you do have to live in an oxygen-rich environment, if you're using oxygen, one of the ways to um, eliminate or detoxify these other forms of um, oxygen-containing free radicals is to produce enzymes that diffuse them. And one of these is um, superoxide dismutase, which often just simply goes by the acronym SOD. We make a lot of this, it's in our livers and in other tissues, but SOD helps to uh, get rid of superoxide, this stuff here. Um, Catalase is another enzyme. This is abundant in all of our tissues, but the liver especially, because that's our main detoxifier. Um, catalase um, breaks down H2O2. It breaks down hydrogen peroxide. It's an enzyme that catalyzes that. So catalase, it's, it's itself not a participant in the chemical reaction. It just facilitates the chemical breakdown of H2O2, the water, and gaseous oxygen O2. And so when you put peroxide on a cut, um, your own catalase in your body will break it down and you'll see oxygen bubbles that are released and that's what the foaming is. <clears throat> the reason that you put peroxide on a cut is to overwhelm bacteria that could cause infection that don't have catalase. So anyway, Organisms can have those and other kinds of enzymes that they use that enable them to live in the presence of oxygen. If they don't have these things, if they don't have SOD, 
they don't have catalase, they're kind of not going to be equipped to deal with oxygen. So they'll find places that don't have oxygen. Low oxygen environments, um, those that are devoid of oxygen, in fact, are described as being anaerobic. Some people use the term anoxic, which means pretty much the same thing. Um, so yeah, those organisms that don't have SOD and catalase would have to opt for that type of lifestyle. <clears throat> so here are the different categories of organisms with regard to oxygen requirements. The general term for an organism that uses um, oxygen is aerobe. And you know, there's different levels of uh, being an aerobe. Aerobiosis would be the name of that, by the way. So if you're somebody that absolutely has to have oxygen, like a human, or say Staphylococcus aureus, which is a skin loving organism, lives on your skin, you'd be an obligate aerobe. So they have to have oxygen, right? So there are quite a number of bacteria and other microbes that fall into that category. Now, some organisms are equipped to detoxify oxygen, but they don't absolutely have to have oxygen. So they would be facultative. The word facultative means, you know, essentially flexible. They, they are switch hitters. They can live in the presence of oxygen and they can use it if they need to. Um, but if no oxygen is available, no problem. They just switch over to a different type of metabolism and they can live for a while that way. So, um, some of these organisms can uh, break down organic molecules in the absence of oxygen and uh, carry out a type of metabolism known as fermentation. So, um, like you would say if you were to take some cabbage and shred it and um, you know, put some salt on it and put it in a, in a crock and cover it up and just stick it away somewhere, bacteria that live on that um, cabbage would start to ferment it and break it down and, and produce some lactic acid which you know imparts a taste that we kind of enjoy and that's how sauerkraut is made so organisms that are used to for that purpose to ferment the cabbage or anything else that we would ferment they're likely to be facultative anaerobes uh, they can live in the presence of oxygen or in its absence they don't care some organisms need oxygen, and they'll always need it, um, but the amount that they require is very limited. So they don't have a whole lot of SOD, and they don't have a whole lot of catalase or other enzymes to detoxify these forms of oxygen that would tend to kill things. So there are microaerophilic organisms that live in environments where the oxygen level, or as we say, oxygen tension is, is kind of low. It's there, but not super abundant. And then we have forms that are anaerobic, that don't use oxygen. Um, some of them are obligately so. Um, they cannot deal with any oxygen at all. So they lack the enzymes to detoxify oxygen and the free radicals containing it. And so we would find these, say, in the bottom of a lake, way down below um, the surface of the water, down in the muds at the bottom of the pond or the lake, where there's no photosynthesis happening and there's no hope of any oxygen getting there. They love that environment. These obligate anaerobes love those places. So, um, you know, places like that, around um, volcanic vents down deep in the ocean. Again, no oxygen there. They're going to love that environment. Your, your colon, in the depths of your colon, in the material that's passing through, there's very little oxygen. And so you, you're liable to find some of these obligate anaerobes there as well. And then you have forms that are typically anaerobic. They spend most of their time in an anaerobic environment. But if some oxygen shows up, they'll be able to deal with it. And so we have forms that are aerotolerant anaerobes. Well, they're not quite the same as these facultative anaerobes. A facultative anaerobe is something that really likes oxygen, but does well in its absence. 
These are things these aerotolerant anaerobes don't like oxygen all that much, but they can handle some of it. So it's kind of opposite sides of the same coin. If you and um, there are other oxygen um, requirement categories among organisms. Those are some of the major ones. And so here you can see these are these are supposed to be uh, culture tubes of uh, you know a, a type of broth that um, has um, different levels of oxygen as you go down th from the top of the broth to the bottom. There's this stuff called thioglycolate. It's a broth that you can make make up. So it's got the nutrients that you would normally use to make up a nutrient broth. But the addition of the thioglycolate causes the formation of an oxygen gradient. So if you were to look at the oxygen concentration in a tube of this broth, really high at the top, but it goes down incrementally as you go from the top to the bottom. So three pluses up here, you know, to two pluses, to one plus, to nothing at the bottom. So that's an oxygen gradient. And so the organisms are going to find a place in if you if you were to cult if you were to inoculate this broth with organisms, they're going to find a place in there that matches their oxygen requirements. So if it's an obligate aerobe, aerobe going to live only at the top of the tube. And you'll see turbidity, cloudiness in that area alone, right? That's where oxygen is really abundant. If it's an obligate anaerobe, you know, down at the bottom of the tube, there's no oxygen, that's where you'll see your cloudiness, your turbidity. If it's a facultative anaerobe, which I said earlier is an organism that kind of likes oxygen but can live in its absence, you can see most of the turbidity is at the top, but you still see some growth even at the very bottom. So lots of turbidity at the top, but less and less and less as you go down to the bottom. And you know, that, that would be indicative of a facultative anaerobe. Microaerophiles, you know, they move down into this zone here where you got some oxygen, but it's nowhere near as high as it would be right at the top. So you can see a band of strong turbidity right there. That's a microaerophile. And then aerotolerance, those are organisms that could care less. And so they don't require um, oxygen, but they don't get inhibited by it either. So you can see the amount of growth is equal all the way through that too. Aerotolerant form. Uh, aerotolerant. These are a, a type of anaerobe that differs from a facultative. And these folks here, you can see they're working in a lab, like at the, the Centers for Disease Control or some other such place, or this USDA, so Department of Agriculture. They're working with some organisms. You can see they got this red colored auger. This is probably a blood auger. Um, and so they're, they're, they're trying to um, culture some very fastidious organisms that have special requirements. And you can see they've got these arm, their arms in these gauntlets. So this is a sealed chamber in which they've adjusted um, gas levels. So they probably excluded oxygen and um, or or if they haven't excluded it entirely, they've altered it, they've brought it down a little bit. So they have to close this chamber off so that oxygen in the air that these folks are breathing doesn't make its way in. And so um, you have organisms that like, say for example, lots of CO2, and that may be something that's in this incubation chamber. Um, so um, CO2 is another gas that organisms require. And, um, so you can adjust its amount as well. Now, organisms that like CO2 um, are described as being capnophiles. So they're probably um, aerotolerant, or they might even be facultative anaerobes. Uh, but instead of using lots of oxygen, in all cases, they, they prefer CO2. 
actually more, more likely to be an aerotolerant organism or an obligate anaerobe. Um, and this gas pack is a, is a convenient sort of uh, incubation chamber. Um, they've got some auger in here, um, which contains blood and some other substances to support the growth of some organism. And uh, what they do is they throw into the, the, the chamber um, some packet of uh, chemicals that literally bind the oxygen there and take it out of circulation and promote a higher CO2 level. Um, they call that little packet of chemicals a sachet, by the way. So it's kind of like the little packet of silicon dioxide beads that they put in your tennis shoes and things like that that keep, keep walt moisture out of them. I throw that in there and then they seal this up and it's airtight. And you can see on the top of this one plate here, they have a little strip that will uh, change colors and, and let them know that the CO2 levels are where they need to be. Um, so it's a colorometric approach that they use. But yeah, you can support the growth of capnophiles using something like this, a little gas pack type of incubation chamber, as opposed to having to work in a big hood like this, a whole lot more expensive and difficult to maintain. And then pH, that's another factor that bears on the lives of organisms. So like temperature, this affects the shape of enzymes and proteins and can cause them to denature. And so organisms will sort themselves out and find the pH conditions that match um, the um, optimal function of their enzymes. So this is genetically determined as well. This is another important niche component is pH. So pH scale runs from zero, where it's, it's extremely acidic, all the way up to uh, 14, which is as alkaline or basic as you can get. At the um, acidic end, the substance that is in solution that predominates is hydrogen ion. And at the alkaline end, the substance that's in solution that predominates is hydroxide, OH minus. So as you go down to the acidic end of the scale towards zero, the concentration of hydrogen ion gets bigger and bigger and bigger. As you go up to 14, the concentration of OH minus hydroxide gets bigger and bigger and bigger. In the middle here, um, at a pH of seven, the amount of hydrogen ion equals the amount of hydroxide ion. They're equal in amount, so it's neither acidic or basic. Again, acids are things that give off hydrogen ions. Bases or alkaline substances give off hydroxide ions. And, um, you know, organisms that live on or in your body, for the most part, it's, it's not always the case. For the most part, these organisms like conditions right around the neutral point of seven. Uh, your body fluids average about a pH of um, 7.4, so slightly alkaline. Your stomach obviously is an exception and there are some few organisms that can live in your stomach where the pH is down in this range, right around the pH of one or two due to the high presence of hydro hydrochloric acid produced by your parietal cells in your gastric glands. Um, so, you know, you have a lot of organisms that like neutral conditions and we're gonna call them neutrophiles. So the organisms that live, um, say in your esophagus, which is not acidic, hopefully, or <laughs> organisms that live in your colon, or the organisms that live on your skin, those are places where the pH is right around seven. Um, if an organism could make its way into your blood, it would love it there if it's a, if it's a neutrophile. Um, you shouldn't have organisms in your blood, by the way. It should be sterile with regard to microbes, but if they ever did come in, get in there and you became septic and experienced so-called blood poisoning, um, those would be neutrophiles that are doing that. 
acidophiles like acidic places. So something like, say, Helicobacter pylori that lives in your stomach um, would, uh, you know, be considered an acidophile. Something that lives, say, in um, an acidic uh, environment like that which you would find in um, uh, Yellowstone National Park. Um, some of the um, uh, geologic formations there, mud pots and geysers and things have acidic conditions associated with them. And of course, at the other end of the spectrum are the alkalinophiles that like alkaline environments. So there are some soils that are highly alkaline. Um, there are even some bodies of water um, that um, are fishless because the, the, the alkalinities are so high, but those places um, will support um, some bacteria and other microbes that are alkalinophiles. So we've got those different categories of organisms that are recognized. And then osmotic pressure, this relates to water and salt balances. So organisms that live in um, really fresh water conditions uh, can't handle a lot of solute in their surroundings. They would prefer that environment. They would thrive there. If you were to take them and throw them in the salt water, it would kill them. Conversely, organisms that like really salty, very hypertonic surrounding conditions wouldn't typically function well in fresh water. Then we have organisms that handle both kinds of conditions, so they can go from fresh water to salt water. And so um, that's a whole other category of things. They're much more broad in terms of their abilities. So um, most organisms exist under relatively hypotonic or isotonic conditions. Most bacteria would prefer, say, a freshwater setting, which is, you know, hypotonic. So water in a pond, um, the water in a creek or something like that, or water in soil. You got water droplets in, in spaces between soil particles. That would be hypotonic or perhaps isotonic, where the concentration of solute is equal to that which occurs in cells. Now, organisms that like really hypertonic conditions are often halophiles. So, like if you were to go out into, say, the American Southwest and go to some of the rivers and streams that pass through parts of, say, West Texas, the Panhandle of Texas, Oklahoma, maybe even parts of Southern Colorado, um, the waters there are really, really rich in chloride salts and um, are even saltier than the ocean. And so bacteria that live there, and there are quite a few, would be considered halophilic. An organism that require, you know, doesn't have really um, major requirements one way or the other that can live in salt water or fresh water is osmotolerant. Some people use the word urey haline to refer to. You can see the root word hail here, the root word hail here that refers to salt. All right, so um, a lot of, not all, but the majority of halophilic prokaryotes are not actually bacteria, but are in the domain archaea. So, uh, unfortunately, one of the genera is halobacteria. They're actually archaea. And the haloarcula, see halo in the, word, in the roots of those. So, that should help you to remember what their osmotic pressure um, uh, capabilities are like. They can handle salty water. And, and one of the things that halophiles, uh, for, forms that can handle hypertonic conditions generally, one of the things that they do is they produce a lot of substances that they um, accumulate in their cytoplasm, which sort of counters the, the tendency for water to be taken out of the cells. So they just, they just elevate their um, tonicity of their cytoplasm 
and um, that helps them to hold on to water. Similar to what sharks do in salt water, they, they accumulate urea in their blood. Blood is solute rich. These archaea and bacteria make their cytoplasm solute rich, and that's what helps them to avoid plasmolysis and uh, shrinkage. And then we've got the barophiles, um, which of all of these different factors is the one I think that is um, probably least significant. But this refers to um, uh, organisms, barophile is a term that refers to organisms that can handle really extreme pressures that would tend to cause cells to literally sort of implode. Um, what you would see, say, for example, in the great depths of the ocean. There are places where the ocean depth is, you know, miles deep, 10, 12, up to 15 miles. Um, in the case of the Marianas Trench in the Pacific Ocean. There are organisms that live in those places that are microbial, and um, they're equipped with uh, adaptations that enable them to withstand the crushing force of that water. I mean, it's so incredibly um, high pressure uh, that it's, it's not even imaginable. Uh, submarines that um, uh, have gone to those great depths that couldn't maintain, um, you know, pressurization to avoid um, implosion have literally just disappeared, it just vaporizes them. That's how high pressure that environment is. Yet there are bacterial organisms, single-celled organisms that can live in those places. So mentions here that cell membranes are made waxy and stiff and uh, they are, there's also the accumulation of fatty acids in the cell membrane. Those are some of the things that help them withstand those high pressures. So we have barophiles. If you're a barophile, you like high pressure. And so here's a picture of a glacier, some ski poles. Somebody's walked all the way up to this high elevation, very cold. Uh, and yet you can see in the snow, there's this sort of um, kind of uh, sort of tinge to it that's reddish. Looks like there's some pollutant in there, but in fact, it's an organism that's living there. Um, this is Clamidomonas nivalis, which is a protestin. It's a kind of uh, al algae, algae. <laughs> excuse me, it's an alga. It's actually one of the green algae which you can see here it's pigmented red and it's using that to to gather sunlight um, to dry photosynthesis. So Nivalis has this reddish color. And so the, the, the question is what sort of temperature category would we place it in? What, what sort of um, requirements does it seem would be optimal for it? So it's definitely not going to be a um, uh, a thermophile or extreme thermophile, um, but it's going to be, and it's not going to be a mesophile, um, but it's one that prefers colder temperatures. Remember I said the the root word that refers to that would be psychophile. So psychophile. In fact, all of these terms here don't even have anything to do with temperature requirements. So that's our answer. All right, so I'm going to stop this lecture here. I'll post this one. I guess I'm going to have to do a third, and this is going to finish us out on the ecology chapter. Stop this one.